Consider that our foreign affairs minister already banned by Russia from traveling there because of her stand on Ukraine, recently led the adoption of the Magnitsky Act in Canada. The government will be supporting this bill. Inspired by the death of Russian lawyer Sergei Magnitsky, who died in a Moscow prison after accusing senior Russian officials of corruption, the act allows Canada to ban those accused of human rights abuses abroad from coming here. Not surprisingly, the act's most vocal critic is Vladimir Putin, who Russian media have reported this week is furious. Russia's foreign ministry has threatened retaliation, the consequences for poking an angry bear, something the United States knows well. On social media, trolls and bots spreading fake news. In the months leading up to the 2016 U.S. election, signs that Russia was interfering started to take shape, and the directive seems to have come from the top. Putin had authorized an aggressive assault against this country. In a new documentary for the PBS program Frontline, producers conducted 60 interviews to piece together what's known so far, including how many in the news media were looking the wrong way. Michael Kirk is the filmmaker behind the documentary called Putin's Revenge. Michael, it would seem that Canada has now irritated Putin. We have our own federal election in about two years. Based on the interviews that you conducted, the research that you've done, and given the American experience in the last election, what should Canadians be watchful for? Well, I mean, what he tried to do in the United States was probe in 21 states, at least 21 states that they know of, uh, election rolls, voting rolls, uh, things like that. He didn't get at the machinery, but uh, the federal government, the intelligence agencies that I've talked to, and that's all three leaders of the three major intelligence agencies in the United States, were uh, deeply concerned about his impact on uh, potential impact on the vote in 2016. It was the thing that really got Barack Obama's attention. Uh, it, it made Obama pull him aside at Hangzhou, the uh, G20 meeting, and, and warn Putin that he had to stop this. And here's the other thing. They figure if Putin is doing it, what is China and other people, other countries, what are they doing as well if, if democracy is that insecure? It's interesting, you point out in the documentary that when the White House first publicly acknowledged its concerns that there had been some level of interference, the news media was largely preoccupied with other stories and didn't seem to grasp the significance of it. I wonder if you wouldn't get into that a bit. Well, it all happens in a, in a sort of microcosm of one day, if you will. October 7th, 2016, the intelligence agencies have been pushing Barack Obama to, to do something about this, to announce that Putin was behind this incursion, this uh, uh, chaos and disruption that was uh, happening all around the election. Obama had been very worried about how to do that. They finally come up with three paragraphs that do not mention Putin, and they roll it out thinking they're going to own the weekend news cycle. They get it to the Washington Post on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Within a half an hour, the uh, Access Hollywood tape breaks and blows uh, the announcement that uh, Russia was, high authorities in Russia were incurring in the United States election. It just blew it right off the front page. Then, within a half hour after the Access Hollywood tape hit, those John Podesta emails, the campaign chairman of Hillary Clinton's campaign that had been uh, grabbed by the Russians earlier in the summer were suddenly released by WikiLeaks. And the drip, drip, drip of those captured the front page for days and weeks right up to the election. And many people in Clinton's campaign believe that's why she lost the election. And the press, of course, willingly had to play along with it. It felt like news. But uh, in the process of all of that, the coverage of Putin's role and Russia's role in the disruption and chaos of the election was left by the wayside. So the news media you know, dropped the ball, arguably, in, in covering what was an indisputably important seminal moment in the election campaign. Now fake news is a part of our reality, whether it's, it's hurled out as a slur about real news or whether it is in fact fake. Is there any way now that you see to meaningfully combat that? 
I'm deeply troubled by uh, the malleability of truth in the world now. This is, if there's an ultimate victory for Vladimir Putin, it is the opacity of truth now. When people do not believe uh, the news, uh, what do they believe? It depends on who's shouting the loudest. It depends on who's tweeting the most. Uh, how, do, how do we uh, get them back? And that, from my point of view, is the awesome challenge that we all face in the so-called uh, uh, middle, uh, the, the big journalism world. Michael, so good to talk to you. Thank you. You're so welcome.